Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adrian K. Wing. I am the director of the University of Iowa Center for Human Rights, which is one of today's sponsors for the webinar for Black History Month entitled The Johnson Family Committed to the Law. I am also the Associate Dean of International and Comparative Law Programs, as well as I've been a member of the Iowa Law faculty for 36 years. I will be the moderator today. The other sponsors for this event include BALSA, the Black Law Student Association, uh, the College of Law, and the Law School DEI Committee. We're very excited today uh, because this event features a family that's had long-term dedication to Iowa law. Four of its members are Iowa law grants that I had the pleasure of teaching. Seems like yesterday, but it was quite a while ago. So uh, you're seeing here the uh, poster from this incredible family. Uh, and they include uh, Mr. Lonnie Johnson, who is the husband of uh, Eartha Jean Johnson. And the two of them are the parents of the Honorable Tiaiva Johnson Bell, the uh, uh, Miss Tierra Johnson Williams, and their youngest son is Antoine Johnson. And they are joined by uh, Judge Bell's husband, Antoy Bell. So their full bios are on the UICHR website, which we hope you'll look at. What I'm going to do is ask each of them to briefly describe their career path. And then I'm gonna ask each one of them a, a question or two. So I'd like to invite uh, all of them to come uh, into view and uh, I will begin my questions. Uh, Lonnie, uh, hard to believe, I remember you as a student, but you are now retired, having spent most of your career working for the corporation Exxon, as well as you were involved in so many activities. Can you uh, give us briefly your career path? How did you come to Iowa law from your home state of Nebraska and, and how did you uh, end up in Houston? And now that you're retired, what are some of the things that uh, you've been involved in doing? Well, uh, thank you for inviting us and, and having us in, uh, for this program. Uh, I came to Iowa Law because my wife, Jean, had started law school at the University, uh, University of Nebraska two years before. I started reading some of our textbooks and it seemed interesting. So I uh, decided to go to law school. And by then we knew a little bit more about rankings in law school. So Iowa was the closest thing with the highest ranking. So I went over and Dennis Shields admitted me and I went to Iowa law, uh, right out of law school. In fact, I interviewed at Exxon while I was in law school, uh, Exxon, Exxon Mobil. And we, uh, I started there right out of law school did litigation for about five years, then did environmental law for one year that I hated. Uh, then I moved to law in, uh, at our refinery and chemical plants in Baytown in Beaumont, Texas, and did that for a while. Uh, did international at, uh, covering Madagascar and Nigeria. Came back and did public affairs for uh, one year, then moved to DC in government affairs. Uh, where I lobbied for Exxon in DC for uh, five years, came back my last five years to spend litigation, and now I am retired. Uh, I, I still dabble in politics a bit on, a, on, a, on the federal side. I'm involved with, with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation board. I, I stayed on that board when I left DC, uh, and, uh, and, and I do fundraisers for some, uh, some of the politicians. And I, I'm in DC quite quite a bit. And I take care of my parents. They're here in, well, along with Gene, we take care of my parents. They're here in Houston and that keeps us pretty busy. Thank you very much. Uh, you said you dabbled a, a, a bit uh, in politics uh, and uh, you're in something now, but uh, 
can you go just a little bit further with uh, what you've been involved in? Well, I, when I was in DC, I, I got to know a lot of the politicians there, including then Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Kamala Harris. So we, um, when, when they were both in the presidential race, we sort of stayed out of the race until there was only one. But then when it was Joe, uh, then we invited him here to Houston, we did a fundraiser for him here at our house and we all had a good time. And then just last week, we had Hakeem Jeffries here, uh, the House Minority Le Democratic Minority Leader. Um, and he was here for a fundraiser last Thursday for the DCCC. So that's really wonderful with such a great career and you're still active and also the commitment uh, the two of you have uh, for helping your parents uh, is, is, is wonderful. And, and of course our students need to think about those things uh, as well as their careers. Okay, so now let's move uh, to Jean who is the one who, who started uh, this law school thing. Uh, can you give us uh, your career path and uh, mention some of the activities that you have been in um, beside uh, your your day job and, 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 and what is closest to your heart. Okay, sounds good. Thank you again for inviting us. I, I can tell you my career was kind of crazy. I, I was at at and well, I was at Northwestern Bell, then went to at and I stayed there and then uh, we went to United Negro College Fund Dinner and Susan um, Taylor spoke and she was talking about a lot of times in life you become complacent. You get in a good uh, situation and you stop dreaming. And that's where I saw myself. I was a top sales rep for at and at the time. I thought I loved my job, but I always wanted to be a lawyer. And I remember the night we were leaving the uh, college fund dinner, I told Lion, I should have gone to law school. He said, you can go. And I'm like, you know, I was doing really well at at and And I'm like, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. But he was the one that started sending out little applications for me to go. And eventually I, I ended up going to Nebraska. It was closed. I had, you know, the kids were there, Lonnie was there, and it, it worked for us. Um, and then uh, the last year, I'd always told Lonnie, I said, Lonnie, you're so articulate. You're good on your feet. You'll be a good lawyer. Nah, 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 nah. I don't want to do that. But when I started telling about some of those cases we were reading, it piqued his interest enough that it got him going. So that's, that's kind of how the law school journey began. After uh, going to law school, I transferred to when Lonnie decided to go to Iowa, I decided to transfer with them so we can keep our family together. And the kids were all on campus, as you remember the days of going to Boston. We would drop them off at school at the time. I think they were they were two, six, and seven when I left. So uh, advanced that up a couple of years. And uh, so at the law school, I stayed there. I got recruited to Exxon. So I came here to Houston. And ironically, Lonnie came the year he came to Exxon too. He loved this job. I hated mine. I was an environmental lawyer, traveled the, really, I traveled the country training um, uh, on environmental cases, commercial litigation. I did a lot. And then it got to a point where Lonnie loved his job a little too much for me. He used to always come home, talk about, you know, his cases. And I was, I was an environmental and I wasn't enjoying that at all. And he said, just quit. And I thought, you know, I, I, what does that look like quit? I've worked pretty much since I was 12. So I, I, I did quit, but I did it before I left Exxon. I started training our executives how to avoid lawsuits. There were so many situations where we were settling winnable, meritless, even frivolous lawsuits. And time and again, it was our own employees' actions and communications that was forcing us to settle those lawsuits. So what I did is um, I designed a class and I started teaching them how to communicate, what to look out for, how to spot risk and address it. And it went over really well. So before I knew it, I'm traveling around the United States for Exxon. I'm a lawyer, but I, I was training and I got to the point where I was training a little too much because my other lawyers at the companies were asking me to train their clients. 
So one time my, my boss came to me and yeah, this is good, you're doing this, but you know, so, you know, but I, I knew I really loved training. So when I left, you know, I took Exxon, a couple other, um, and I just was doing that out of my house. And then as, as life would have it, um, other companies start hearing about this training this person does because it's, it's something that nobody else does. It teaches how to write, how to how to take the negatives and document them in a positive manner without distorting the mess representing the facts. It's, it's just a lot to it. So I, I end up quitting my job to, to really take uh, be with the kids because I had never been home and I have this little sidekick job that starts at like. I mean, it went out of control. Different people come and do it, come and do it. So that's how I started my company. And, you know, I was doing that for a while until about three years ago. Uh, both of my parents, we moved them down from Omaha. They got really sick. And I started taking care of them pretty much. And for the first year, I held it together. But after that, I'm like, no regret. So I, I, I really started taking care of them. Last year, I took the year out that I never really took off because you talked about pro bono and all that. I've always, I've always given back. I've always been involved. I've never, I've never, my life has been for everybody else at how I see it. I even feel like that even now. I, I've been involved on, I can't even tell you the, the boards, but what was Pat, what is really, really, you know, close to my heart is in pursuit of justice. That's a nonprofit I started. And our little slogan is pursuing justice restoring hope and changing the world, you know, pretty much um, going after public officials who betray the public trust. That That is something that I think is needed and necessary. Uh, let me just shut up because I know other people need to talk, but, you know, you know, I've been on uh, all kinds of boards, national, local, um, and I've tried to be a giver. I've been appointed, I was appointed to the National Women's Business Council. That, that was a, a, a political appointment. So I was really proud to get that. Uh, and that's been some time ago. I've been on the National Institute for the Severely Handicapped um, uh, Women's Business Enterprise um, Business Council. I'm a woman of distinction there. It's just, you know, I've done a lot, but it's just not about me. It's about, you know, what do I leave back? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, you two, uh, as a couple, uh, have been outstanding uh, in your community and as parents. And uh, clearly, um, you inspired uh, all three of your children uh, to, to look at the law. And, and I remember them, little children, running around the law school. So it's wonderful to uh, see them, of course, all grown up, very grown up. And so now we're going to uh, move to uh, your daughter, who uh, has distinguished herself, I believe, by becoming the first judge in your family. Uh, so uh, the Honorable Tiaiva Johnson Bell, uh, can you give us your career path? Uh, what made you decide to become a judge and uh, how do you like it so far? Um, I am, my career path is really simple. I've always been criminal law. I think my dad, when I started school in college or when I went to Spelman College, um, my dad, I told him I wanted to be a criminal lawyer. He decided to put me on an internship with one of his friends, Judge Hill at, in Harris County at the, at the, on the bench doing criminal that of criminal court cases. He figured I would hate it and I would make the right decision it backfired because I absolutely loved it and all I wanted to do is criminal. I graduated from the University of Iowa. The week after taking the bar, I started at the DA's office. I worked there for several years. Then me and my husband, um, who also went to the University of Iowa, I graduated from Iowa in 2004. Um, mm -hmm. Then me and Antoy started our own business after I left the DA's office, Bell and Associates. And then in 2011, um, Harris County opened up the first public defender's office and I know the reputation that some of them get and in light of the fact that it was gonna be representing people here in Harris County in the community that I live in, everybody's entitled to good representation, not just representation. They need zealous advocacy and it needs to be understood that when you are speaking for somebody, especially in indigent spaces, they won't have a lot of people that visit them. They don't have the money for the lawyer. You are their voice and if, we were going to start it, you know, starting at the ground. I wanted to be in that space. And 
help start it and make it an office we could all be proud of. I worked there from 2011 and 2019. Um, I've been trying to get a youth court passed and my boss had come in several times just like, so you gonna run so you can be on youth court because you trying to do something that is kind of outside the box and nobody's gonna take it on. The first couple of times I kind of dismissed it. Um, and then I had a PSI hearing where my young kid had aggravated robbery cases. And my only, I was an advocate and I was just like, judges don't be doing anything, they just sit there. And after my PSI hearing, I was really, it was a multiple ag rob case, but when they did the mitigation, even the victim of the offenses start cr crying in court and wanting a probation, the principal of the school came in. So the judge took a shot and gave this hit probation. I come home, I was like, yeah, I did that. And then Antoine was just like, oh, this is a good job. Did you have, did the judge have one PSI hearing or did he have multiple? I, was, I don't know, I know he did mine. I think there was another one after mine. And he says, oh, you saved one, but I think he may have been able to save more, but you're right. Judges don't get to do anything. And I did stop talking to him for that day because you were raining on my parade a little bit, but it did make me reconsider it. And given that youth court is something that I really want, and it's not something that's done with the goal of graduating kids from college is done with these little, we do a little raggedy probation and then they're off it in five minutes but they still have the same issues and it doesn't take a holistic approach, it's unsuccessful. So if I wanted to do something different, I kind of look at the job, so I kind of like doing time, but I'm going to do time to get the result I want. And the result I want is I want to see the changes in my community. I can't tell you how many times as a public defender, I heard my client say, hey, miss, you know, I could do that. I can do standing in my head. My daddy went to jail, my cousin went to jail. So if seeing people go to prison makes you feel like that's ultimately going to be your reality. What about if I change the game and instead of sending his kid to TVC, I send him to college. So when his cousin visits him or his brother visits him, he visits him in college. That then becomes the path and that becomes their family trajectory. Kind of like there were no lawyers in the family. Then there were my mom and dad. And now they're all of us. When you open up a new opportunity and expose a different group of people to something new, they might migrate it to, into it, be successful. And that's what I hope to do with my program. Once it is a national model and everybody in the country bandwagon it, the old advocate gets to come out and reemerge and find another space to play. Hmm. Uh, right now you're uh, on the bench in which court? I'm in 339th Criminal District Court in Harris County. So we handle everything from low level PCS to grams, PCS less than the grams to capital murder cases. And I have the distinction of while as a public defender, despite the fact I didn't get to choose my clients, I had the highest dismissal rate out of any lawyer in the courthouse. Um, since being on the bench, I have one of the highest clearance rates, but I also try more cases than every other court every year that I'm on the bench because I feel like, man, speedy trial means something. So we're gonna try these cases. I also think it's interesting, you know, in terms of talking about your parents as role models, uh, they had the three of you and you and Antoy have three uh, daughters uh, a, a, as well. And Tiara, you have three, uh, we'll, we'll come to you, but you also have three children. And so that all of you have been combining uh, your intensive careers with your family. And so let's go to your other half, uh, Antoy Bell. Now, I remember you all as young law students who were dating back then. And so that that's like 20 years ago, right? Uh, and uh, you're still together and <laughs> doing great things. So Antoine, <clears throat> tell us, you're not, you're not a Johnson, <clears throat> sorry, but you married a Johnson. So you didn't have parents, I assume that were lawyers you were already in some other career. How, how did you decide to go into law? And what would you tell our law students today? Yeah, so my father-in-law made me go into law. No, I'm just joking. Um, so um, I started off as an accountant um, and I was uh, working for a, uh, uh, as an auditor uh, for one of the big five at the time in public accounting. Uh, I was working for uh, Arthur Anderson uh, in Houston, and uh, well, some of you may not be old enough to remember, but uh, that was uh, in the in 2000, uh, and that was the time of the uh, Enron debacle, and Arthur Anderson was the auditors for Enron, 
And uh, along with um, Enron going down, uh, Arthur Anderson went down as well. And I remember feeling uh, helpless uh, at, at that time period. And uh, I said to myself that I would never be uh, in this position again uh, where, where I'm helpless and I can't control my own destiny. Um, and I thought, you know, I already have a business degree. Going to law, law school will, will help me uh, control my own destiny no matter where I am. And so uh, summer of, of 2002, uh, we entered the, uh, the, the summer program. Um, and, um, you know, even we finished in 2004, but we consider ourselves 2005 uh, a class reunion uh, because of all, all the other uh, uh, people with that class. But uh, so I graduated law school and then I, I began to practice. I had a, a I started off in, in litigation on the plaintiff side, plaintiff litigation, joined a firm uh, doing plaintiff litigation in Houston. Uh, enjoyed that, doing a lot of medical malpractice, uh, lawsuits, doing uh, employment uh, uh, discrimination type lawsuits. Uh, and then from there, uh, Tiava and I, we formed our own firm uh, doing uh, more of the same um, um, personal injury and, and criminal defense and probate work. And then uh, began doing some consulting work uh, with that employment uh, background. Uh, joined joined Legal Watch as a consultant, doing some of that training, and then eventually ended up uh, in human resources and and, and leading uh, the human resources uh, department of a, of a couple corporations as the director of human resources, and and that's what I'm doing today. Great. Um, so it's great you used you know you had a business degree, you have a law degree, now you're in uh, this this corporate side. <clears throat> not practicing law, but obviously all of your skill set is incredibly useful. So what is the advice you'd be giving to students today about what, how should they, you know, look at their careers uh, uh, that they have? Yeah, the one thing I would say is, is don't pigeonhole yourself. Uh, the, leave, leave all the doors open and, and uh, work so that, you know, you can be flexible um, and to, to change courses and do other things uh, should you choose to. You know, when, when going to law school, I, it wasn't a dream of mine. I never, never thought about being a lawyer, um, but, but I was make myself flexible enough where I could pivot and, and become a lawyer. Uh, going into HR uh, wasn't a dream of mine. I had, had no plans on doing HR, um, but I, I think I was, I was flexible enough where I could pivot and I could go into HR. So, so that, that's what I would say is, is don't uh, have a narrow-minded uh, tunnel vision. Uh, be, be able to be flexible and, and, and do whatever it takes because you may pivot and you don't know where that law degree is gonna take you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Now we'll move to Tierra. I remember her running around the law school as, as a small child. And today uh, you are an assistant district attorney. Can you tell us your career path? And of course, you also have three, three children. Uh, and can you also tell us what might you have done differently in your career? And what are you planning to do in the future? Um, so my career path, I did not think I was ever going to be a lawyer. I thought I was going to be a starving artist somewhere in California somewhere. Um, but things didn't pan out that way. I went to Spelman and decided I was going to go ahead and pursue law. I initially wanted to be an entertainment lawyer. I went to Nebraska and there was, we did have um, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, and there were some um, sports law and entertainment law classes, but the, the environment was just not conducive to that type of practice. So I decided most entertainment lawyers also need a criminal lawyer. So I decided to go to the public defender's office and I interned with the public defender's office in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, really from my first, the end of my first year through graduation. And I became interested in criminal law and I kind of just forgot about the entertainment law. Um, criminal law was inter interesting. I graduated and came down to work in Houston with Tiva and Antoy. Um, I did that, but they had criminal law down. Um, so I decided to branch off into family law. So I did most of the family law cases with Bell and Associates. Um, until they both left, essentially. T.I. went to the PD's office and then Antoy went out. So I was by myself for a little while and I decided to go to the DA's office. I, 
I had a lot doing divorces. I had a lot of domestic violence, victims of domestic violence. Um, and that, that became very, um, I don't know, it, it became a passion for me to fight for victims of domestic violence and not just from a not monetary perspective, but I wanted to lock them up. So I decided the DA's office was the best place to go. Um, I interviewed and knew that I wanted to do domestic violence. Most of my time, I've been there since 2018. Most of my time has been there in the, in the domestic violence division, both on a misdemeanor level and a felony level. Um, now I'm in the 262nd district court where I do pretty much everything, all felonies. Um, and I, I find it very fulfilling. It's very, it's a lot of work um, just because, I mean, I'm in Harris County, Texas and there are lots of criminals in Harris County, Texas. Um, so I try to balance with my kids as much as I can. Um, I, I do the best that I can, but I, I depend on my retired or semi-retired parents a lot. Um, for help when it comes to managing my household. Um, what I would do differently, nothing. I think everything, everything, my steps, I feel like they have always been ordered. Like I didn't know what I was gonna do, but I sort of just ended up in the right space at the right time. And, and I feel like, I don't know, it's God's work. When, when you're able to do something the way that I do it, no one else could do. And with my background, specifically in domestic violence, there's a level of passion that I have that that is um, unmatched. And I think bringing that to my practice is has been very helpful for me. Um, I also like, I mean, I, I've been uh, on the chair for Habitat for Humanity through the Houston Bar Association. And we do one of our, my projects, we help build houses for the underprivileged in, in the Houston area. Um, and I enjoy that work too. Uh, what would I what I plan on doing in the future is probably that. I mean, somehow I want to find a way to merge merge them a little bit better so I can spend more time dealing with the habitat side. But I mean, I can never walk away from criminal. I love it. <laughs> uh, I I wonder uh, if you have in mind. I mean, with all these role models, uh, uh, you could become a judge. Or you could go into the corporate uh, sector, or you could uh, start your own company, or uh, go out of law together, or any of those well, things we, in your head. <laughs> tried to hustle my dad into that idea multiple times to have a family practice. That would be so amazing, but he's 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 not really on board. <laughs> uh, okay, great. So let's move to. Uh, the youngest uh, member of this distinguished uh, clan, Antoine, was a very small child uh, running around Iowa. I don't know how much, uh, Antoine, you, you remember uh, being coming through Iowa. Uh, can you tell us uh, your career path and uh, how have you balanced uh, your career in criminal law defense with uh, your family obligations? Um, it was, uh, I say my career to be a lawyer was not traditional. I would say I didn't have a dream of being a lawyer. That's not really what I wanted to do. Um, I like art. I was really into film and music and things of that nature. That's really what my passions were. Um, long story short, I just got accused of a crime that I didn't commit. And, uh, that kind of put a, uh, an interest in, in me as far as the law was concerned that wasn't there before and, uh, made that something that I wanted to do. So I went to the law school and, and you know, passed the bar and uh, started practicing. But uh, all in all, I still have a lot of different passions and like a lot of different things. So what I will say that law, I really love it. I enjoy going in and doing criminal defense, especially when there are cases that I really believe in. Um, because I do private work, I'm allowed to screen my cases, which means that if you come into my office and you convince me that, you know, this is a case where there is something here that's worth fighting for, I'm going to fight and I'm going to fight hard. Um, so it's, it, it gives you that ability to be able to help people that way. But at the same time, it, 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 was, it won't make you rich overnight, but it gives you the, the freedom to be able to do other things. Um, meaning like I, I like movies. So a friend of mine, we do movie production, uh, uh, got into trucking, got, uh, just basically got a, a truck and trailer and started doing that during the pandemic when COVID came. Courthouses were shut down. 
and uh, you still need a way to earn. So got a truck and a trailer and started driving loads, you know, we go back and forth from California, different places. And um, then from there, it was just trying to build a business from that and trying to hire drivers that won't tear your trucks up. And, you know, uh, just a business there to uh, to work and just try to try to make a means to providing. Um, then like just little little projects here and there. It, it allows you the ability to do other things with a law degree. I think it's probably the best profession to go into because it's one of those things where first off, as a defense attorney, you kind of set your own schedule, meaning I pick the days that I go to court. And I can pick, you know, when my clients go, if I want to stack and go to court on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I can do that. And I can have, you know, Thursday, Friday to do whatever uh, business ventures that I want to do with things of that nature. So, um, you know, I like it in that regard. And, uh, you know, it's just been a, a been a, a good job for me. I really enjoy it. And um, it's given me the opportunity to do a lot of other things. I have a newborn baby right now who is two months old. So um, that's been a balancing thing. Uh, Jeff, I'm trying to balance everything out as far as the time, because it does require a lot of time. When you're working these cases, you have to, you know, you have jail visits. You want to go meet with your clients in jail and you want to talk to them about their issues, um, get a deep understanding of, you know, their version of events. And then you have to take that and compare it to the evidence. And um, to really be good at it, you need to do certain things. Like I, I, I take pride in memorizing my evidence. I want to know what happened four minutes and 32 seconds into that surveillance video. You know, it's important to, to master that. And if once you can do that part, it's easy to go and have a conversation with the prosecutor, highlight the strengths of their case, the weaknesses of their case, the strengths of yours and the weaknesses of yours. And usually what ends up happening is you end up coming to some sort of, sort of agreement. Um, very few cases go to trial, but um, the times I have, I haven't lost. So, so things are going on that. Um, but I mean, that's pretty much it. That, that, that's me in a nutshell. Well, thank you all uh, for this, uh, these small snippets of uh, incredible careers that each of you has had, and of course, most of you are still having, and some of you are still at the early phases of your career. But uh, of course, the mentorship uh, and role modeling from uh, Jean and Lonnie affecting uh, not only their own biological children, but even their, their, their son-in-law and the confidence you, you all uh, resonate uh, from uh, your achievements and um, the fact that you all have, uh, you're very creative and combine uh, different things with law and that you're all dedicated to the community that you're in on local and national levels. Uh, and that's so important. It's not just about uh, personal, did I earn a lot of money, but what, how can I give back as a person, a black person who's committed to the community? Um, and so, uh, and then of course, taking it to the next generation uh, as well. So we're now going to go to the questions. And one of the questions is, do any of the grandkids show an interest in being a, a lawyer? And, and so, what are the ages of the, the grandkids? Uh, T. Ivan, Antoy, how old are your kids? Tiara, uh, Antoine has a, a newborn, <laughs> uh, but how old are the other six? Um, I have three girls. My oldest, Anila, is 16 years old. Absolutely not. I, we went through phases. I think she'll ultimately be an activist, but right now she's an anesthesiologist. That's what our last thing was I think they've lawed out they've heard it from everywhere every space they go so um that is her my young or my middle child is Avani Avani is 12 about to be 13 and Avani is interested in track and that's all she's really talking about now that or being a professional um a professional influencer or TikTok or YouTube so I guess those are the seventh grade aspirations and then my youngest is Ava. Ava is nine. She is now working on becoming the next Serena Williams because she is taking up tennis and she's doing well and actually enjoying it. Okay, Tierra. Um, so my oldest is 18, and that's Lonnie. Um, he is in true 18 year old form and doing his own thing in the world, um, enjoying being grown for the first time. My uh, middle child is Levi. He is 11. He'll be actually, he'll be 12 next month. And mark my words, he's going to be a famous producer some way, somehow. Like he is, 
since he was two, I have pictures of him playing the drums, but there are uh, adults now that call him to make beats for him, um, mm -hmm. for them. So he's really into music, has always been into music. Um, so I know that, that he's not gonna travel the law path. Although he's very uh, analytical, he has a lawyer's mind, but he applies it to music. And then my baby girl, no, she wants to be a dancer. She's very clear. She wants to be a ballerina or a dancer. Um, so I don't, I don't see law, but you never know. I didn't think I was ever going to be a lawyer and, and I love it. So who knows? Right. When you all were their ages, were any of you all thinking of law? Yeah, I, I used to like hold trials that when we got in trouble before the parents came home, she would hold trials as a prosecutor, like a pretend prosecutor. Um, but yeah, that was never me and Antoine. We, Antoine and I, we never had that, that goal as, 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 as children. And so it'll be interesting 10 years from now, right? When these children <laughs> are much older to see if any of them uh, have become lawyers. Um, and, and then I wanted to ask um, Jean and, and Lonnie, uh, do you, are you one of those families where like, you know, you have the, the Sunday dinner and everybody's there and the grandkids are running around and everybody's talking about law or is was is that like not part of what? Uh, no, no, you know? we do that a lot. We do that a lot. We're always together as a family. We're really, really close. Uh, the older people, we may talk about law. Some the young kids, they're just not feeling that right now. They're out in the pool or whatever, but they are not having that conversation. Uh, we do play games with them because we think it's important for them to know the law. Uh, and they do. It's surprising how much those little kids are picked up. Um, but no, no, we do a lot, but it's not like you think. But we we do have those engaging conversations. Mostly about criminal law. Amen. <laughs> well, especially since you've had people be defense and prosecution and judging, it it just seems like it would be ideal for a for a a TV show. Uh, yeah, right? and I, that, that, that you mentioned that, I wanted to be a criminal lawyer. That's why I went to law school. And as life would have it, because I was, you know, I, I quit my job and Lonnie went, I couldn't take that job. I think I, the offers were too low. I had to go for corporate. But I'm kind of living my life through the kids. It's just how this worked all. I've learned so much in my nonprofit really is through the things that they tell me, the, the stories they share, you know, of things that are happening out there. But um, it's kind of, I, I love the fact that they are doing public service. I don't think any of us went to law school to make money. That's the crazy thing. Most people think of it as going to make money. I think we all wanted to save the world in some kind of way. I still think that, except for Antoine, you know, he got a little entrepreneur, you know, he, 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 he's, he's the money more, money more guy more than the, the rest of us. <laughs> okay, here's another question, uh, another comment. Uh, wonderful to hear stories from Johnson family members. I'm interested in hearing practical tips on how to juggle family life, especially with children, uh, as grad students, a busy vocation, and community. Uh, so, uh, Antoy, uh, what practical tips? Uh, I'm a, I'm on Facebook with this this family, and I. I have many beautiful pictures of Antoy with his, his three daughters. Uh, I don't know where you're going, but you all look so wonderful. So I, I, I certainly uh, like to ask you first uh, about juggling. Yeah, so I, I think um, some of it is you gotta be uh, intentional about putting, putting your family first. I mean, you, you gotta make that important to you uh, when you're thinking about uh, your career and what type of career you want to have, um, and and then the the other side of that is is your your support system and and, and your network. But I, I think you know family is is very important to all of us, and so you know that that plays a role um, in in any job that I take, any business that I start. You know how will this affect my family, and how will I be able to dedicate time to my family. Um, and, and, and that's the, the kind of balancing of it, of, you know, um, my dreams, my family dreams, I need to combine them both and, and make it happen and not uh, just shoe one for the other. Now, 
practical tip really quickly. When I was in law school, for the law students that are asking that, I would, my homework, when I would read it, I would change it to a bedtime story. I don't know if they remember how, I would change that up and help me to remember it. But those are things that you can do that help yourself and help them at the same time. That's incredible, right? Um, now, I think it's been mentioned that uh, grandparents now, Jean and, and Lonnie, that you uh, at some points are able to help with these grandchildren. And I was just wondering, you know, have all of you all had to, you know, hire combinations of babysitters, nannies, you know, daycares, after school programs? I mean, how have, you know, this is seven children, uh, seven grandchildren for um, Jean and, and Lonnie, uh, how do you, how have you done that? Have you turned down jobs that would require very long hours or, um, you know, realistically? I'll take it because it. that's me. When I was in law school, this is a shout out to my parents. Um, I was uh, with my son at that time, he was around two. And I did the same thing, mom. I don't even know if I, if I did that subconsciously or what, but I used to read stories to, to my son Lonnie at that time when I was in law school. Um, and then whenever finals would come, I would he would go with my parents and they would keep him so I could take finals and I wouldn't have to, you know, worry about whether he's gonna be okay. Um, they, they, even now, if I'm in trial or something's going on, you know, I, I, I work late hours during those, uh, during trial um, and they'll, you know, they'll take the kids whenever I need them. I mean, they're, I mean, a phone call away and, our family is like that, where, you know, it doesn't matter if you, if you need help, then the family stands up to help. So we haven't had to rely on, you know, outsiders to, to help raise our children to that, that to that effect, because we have some, there's going to be a family member, most of the time it's my parents, but there's going to be a family member, a part of our village that's going to be able to help when it comes to, to raising the kids in our absence. And, you know, that's, of course, the strength of having you all be in the same town. When I moved from New York to Iowa, I had no relatives within a thousand miles and had to hire uh, a woman from China and she and her husband moved in and stayed with us five whole years um, so that I could be a professor and, and run around the world. And, and uh, we stayed in touch with that family, but uh, I literally had the, the live-in nanny uh, from uh, another country as, as part of the ways I tried to uh, communicate. And sometimes when school was closed, like today in Iowa City, the school is closed. I brought my kids into the office and there were students who were like, oh, I'd love to babysit while I'm having student conferences or something. And I felt, oh God, should I even have them do this at all? But they you know, wanted to do it. So uh, for this question, person asking the question, you know, you gotta get support from around you, whether it's biological family, or other people uh, to help you because you you cannot juggle it uh, just all uh, by yourself. Uh, we have another question, uh, Judge Bell. Uh, how are you getting the word out about? I believe you mentioned the youth probation, or what is it exactly? It's a youth court. Um, it is. It's something that it's not really much word out. This probation is a little different in that it's not dealing with no lo low level nonviolent offenders. Um, the reality of the situation is those kids that end up coming through these the court system, the juries are gonna give them probation, but they're not gonna give them any of the resources necessary to successfully complete the probation. I didn't realize that I was a big nerd until I got into some part of the system and I just nerded out. And I'm one of those people that look at stats in order to make a determination as to what is the best result to happen. If the stats tell me that if a kid goes into TDC between, TDC is the Texas Department of Corrections, that's prison here. If the stats tell me if a kid goes in between the ages of 17 and 22, that they're likely to go back a second time, but when they go back that second time, they're likely to have three victims. But it also tells me if a kid finishes the second year of college, you don't even have to get through all four. By completing a second year of college, the stats show me that it's an 18% chance that you're likely to ever be arrested before. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for some of the violent cases, it can be really bad, 
and really anger the first person. But if by doing the probation, making them successful, I put them in a space to stop the other three people from ever becoming victims, then you make the smart choice. I think we've been taking a lot of, we're going to be tough on crime, but we've been tough on crime for a long time. And we're still locking our doors and still kind of unsafe to walk down the streets and it's getting worse. So you got to do something different. I worked on the program for a while before I became a judge. I tried to get other judges to do it, but given that I wasn't doing the low level nonviolent offenders, a lot of them would not. Um, I lobbied my fellow judges after I got on the bench, we created a program. Now those cases will be transferred to me. When they get transferred, they don't get an automatic probation. You gotta have skin in the game. And that means you're interviewed by a panel that can consist of a member of the district attorney's office, public mm -hmm. defender's office, law enforcement community, all of those people together get together, they make a recommendation as to whether this kid is considered. Then they're set up with educational resources and a team. When you meet your educational milestones and you're in the phase where you're in space that you're applying to college and you've met all those metrics, then you go on to probation. You finish this program by graduating your second year in college and then we're trying to get um, the local district attorney's office to sign off on being in a space where they allow for the petition for non-disclosure to be done early. So when this kid is finishing up their fourth year in college and they've clearly shown, I am not who I was when I was 17, I am so different, then we're asking them to go ahead and erase that so they can apply for jobs and walk into the person that they've become. I just, I think that we've been doing it wrong for a long time and it's time to step away from how we've done it and reinvent the wheel in order to see things change and the trajectory of how things are going in our neighborhoods, our communities, it needs to be different. So we gotta do something different. And that's what we're doing here. Hearing your talk, you sound like a future politician. Absolutely I was... not. I am the worst politician <laughs> that you will probably meet on the planet. We run for uh, judicial races, and I am the worst fundraiser that mm. anybody has ever met in their entire life. When you call your friend that's a plastic surgeon saying, hey, you know, I'm wanting you to support my campaign, and you muster up a request for $20, that means that this was, politician stuff is not my skill set. I'm not good at the raising money part. Amen. Well, you obviously were good enough to to win, right? <laughs> now I had an amazing team that consisted of my mom and dad, and they were able to definitely assist in those deficiencies. I, I admit when I'm deficient in areas, and politician is that area I'm deficient in. <laughs> we were well, on. <laughs> well, since your your parents uh, have definitely been in, in involved in supporting uh, politicians. Uh, on uh, state and national levels, uh, apparently very successfully, do any of you uh, from the, the younger generation see yourselves uh, perhaps one day uh, uh, considering a political career? You, you just said you all just saw Hakeem Jeffries, who's very prominent in Congress. Uh, so, um, you know, you've probably talked to lots of other politicians. And so many politicians have legal training. So uh, Judge Bell is saying, no, uh, it's not her. But what about uh, the rest of you in considering that within your potential next uh, steps? We're going to draft Antoine and Antoine. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been a big no for me, just because I'm a very private person. And I just like my time with my family. I don't really deal with, spend a lot of time with people outside of the family. We are a very close knit group. Um, there isn't really anything you we need, well, I need anyway in the world that I don't get from these five. Meaning that as far as when something I want to go sit down on the couch and talk to somebody, I'll go at, to my parents' house or one of my sister's house. I want to be around kids before I have my own. I will go to my sister's house. I have a room in everybody's house. I, this is this, I'm going to be there now that I have my daughter. I, I don't stay in them much, but I'm always making sure I have presence around all of my family because that's just who I feel I'm comfortable with. So, um, but as far as politics is concerned, I've always been a big no. It's been a very big no. But now I've been kind of thinking about it a little bit because I think that when it comes to things that you don't like, the way to change it is to get in the game. If, if, if things aren't operating the way that you would have them be, you can't really complain if you're just going to sit back on the sidelines and not jump in. I know that if I were ever to jump into that arena, I'm going to bring a completely different mind frame than most of the people I see walking the hills of uh, the, the halls of Washington, D.C. 
So I think that a lot of times we have a situation in which things aren't the way we want them to be because we don't have representation in the places that 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 can make the change. So I know I've been thinking about it a little bit lately, but I don't know. I just don't know how that would fit with my life and my family and my privacy and not want to shake hands and meet every stranger I meet. Like everybody, that, well, that's my person. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Toy, I guess you're going to be drafted, uh, uh, according to your father-in-law. Uh, you have any interest in, in, in this? I, I would, I would be a hypocrite if I said I, I'm, I'm closing it all out. Let's just say never say never and be ready to pivot should the need arise. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like yes, you. <laughs> Uh, Tiara? I don't see that for myself. I told you I, I was going to be a starving artist. I'm a hippie at heart and I, I've seen I've seen politicians not be able to do what they want to do because they have to please other people and that's just not me. That's not me. Now I appreciate their efforts but I, I don't see that for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to give each of you a chance if you want to say something, um, you know, students uh, are watching now and uh, we actually often get more viewers uh, after a webinar. Um, and so if you could, uh, some of you have said, you know, don't box yourself in or into any one area, but if, um, the rest of you who haven't talked on this would like to make uh, some kind of a remark for uh, the students. Our, our BALSA chapter is very large. It has over 40 students and uh, they include people from Africa and the Caribbean as well as African-American. Uh, many of them today are uh, en route to Chicago to the regional Midwest regional BALSA. Uh, so they're very dedicated, very ambitious, uh, doing very well. So uh, I'm sure they would like to hear uh, any tips you have. Uh, Jean and, and Lonnie, uh, what, what years did you, did you graduate? I was 1990. I was 91. So you, you've been around almost as long as me, uh, not quite, but certainly a very long time. So I'm going to bash you on this, but I, I have held a grudge for you for the longest. The only C I ever got, you gave it to me. I'm like, <laughs> I had all A's and B's, and I'm like, she done messed up. I, 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 I'm, I'm still feeling some kind of way, but I kind of got over it after 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I'm going to give you a hard time with that, but what I will say about something Antoy talked about is be in a position to pivot, but not only that, open your mind, just don't, you, you don't know what you don't know. So you don't know there's something else out there that you might not, you may like practicing until you expose yourself. Do as much as you can, get involved everywhere you can. And that's the way you're gonna find your way. Because at the end of the day, you, you can think this is what I want, but all these left uh, missed opportunities out there because you wouldn't even open your eyes long enough to even go experiment it. When my kids are little, if they told us they didn't want anything to eat, it's something uh, they don't like. I said, did you taste it? No. We'll let them taste it. They like it. We don't give it to them. So they can know, taste everything. If you don't like it, you know, that's fine. But be able to know, I don't like this. I guess I, okay. I would say people, um, make sure you don't let others define success for you. I mean, success as I view it might be totally different from what you view as, as success. But if you can find something you enjoy doing and be able to monetize that, to me, that is that is the ultimate. But but you know, I remember when I was in, when I accepted the job at Exxon, I had a, a certain professor, not you, <laughs> a certain professor at at, um, at at Iowa that told me, I can't believe you sold out to the oil companies. And, and I, I think my, my job at Exxon allowed me to do, allowed me to make a living and, and, and feed my family, but it also allowed me to do a lot of things outside for the community, uh, things that I want to do personally. So I just, my thing is don't let other people define success for you. 
go and do what you know, do you view as, as success for you and, and you know go after that and on that note that i tell the kids if you're trying to be like everybody else who's going to be who god created you to be don't feel like you got to fit somebody else's mold be you whatever that is and that you know you're unique enough yourself and you don't have to follow anybody else's lead mm -hmm. I, I would also add point. to uh the the advice for the, the the student body is relationships oh, yeah. relationships are important and and the people that you are with right now are going to be important relationships in your career future you know we, we and when i started in iowa we started with the force and there's there's people that uh i still communicate with and talk to and pick up the phone when i need a lawyer in chicago and say hey uh this is what i have going in chicago do you know anybody can handle this or can you handle this and, and, and we have those relationships all over the country uh, because of what we started working on uh, over 20 years ago at the University of Iowa. And so, you know, a friend of mine always say, you got a lot of living to do. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of living to do. And those Amen. relationships that you, that you make now are very important. Uh, whether you make good ones or you make bad ones, uh, it, it, it's going to uh, come back to you. I, I will second that. Um, Right when I finished law school and passed the bar, immediately I went to work for myself. Um, I, I went to start to do criminal defense right away, didn't want a boss, wanted to do everything myself, and I started it that way. I'm comfortable now in my practice and being able to, to do the things right, but I will say that if I had to do it all over again, that's not the path I would have taken. I probably would have gone either to work for a prosecutor first or maybe a, a public defender's office, or at, at best get a mentor and have somebody that you work with because when you're doing something, you're going into an arena. People have been doing this 20, 30 years before you walked in the door. So it would be wise to find someone that knows what you're doing and have them show you because the learning curve is a lot shorter when you have someone that knows what they're doing, teaching you how to do it. Um, I, I, it stuff took me a lot longer um, to learn because I was doing everything myself and didn't want to ask for help. Try to do everything myself when it comes to my business. And um, that doesn't always work out for you in, in when you're trying to get things done mm -hmm. thoroughly. Like you can get whatever you want, but if you go with a team, you usually go farther and you'll, you, you know, you'll be more fulfilled along your journey. So it's a situation now where I have questions that I go and have to have answered or, or I'll do CLEs to learn things. But these are things that I think I would have known a lot sooner had I had a mentor or someone that I align myself with early in the game that will be able to teach me. And, and not just within criminal, but within other facets of law. Like I've stuck with criminal because that's where my passion lies. But there are things now I'm starting to do civil cases here and there just because sometimes, I mean, this is a really good case, a really good opportunity. Um, you know, you want to do those things. So you have, it, it's important to foster relationships with people um, that can guide you and kind of teach you how to, how to do things. Because even people that think they know everything, we don't know everything. It's a lot more. I would we say only have a couple minutes left. So go ahead. I would say that you're going to fail a bunch of times as a lawyer. You're going to come out of school and there are things that you don't know. The thing, it takes forever to build a reputation. It takes like seconds to utterly obliterate that reputation. Take the high road. Be cognizant of how you treat people. When you walk in a courtroom, speak to the clerk, speak to everyone. Don't be a respecter of persons. You will be surprised the traction you get because people will say you're really good. One of the reasons I was able to do really well on the prosecution side and the defense side is my word was my bond. I wasn't going to misrepresent it to you. And sometimes people are just like, I know she ain't telling me everything, but she's pushing this hard. She knows something we don't know. In the defense side, I definitely knew something you didn't know. But your word is everything. It's okay to fail. It is okay to get it wrong. You don't walk on water. You don't perform miracles, but be the best version of yourself and remind yourself to give yourself grace and space, but give it to other people. Always prepare but just make sure to keep it above board and don't do the little cheat things or cut the corners because it can kill a reputation. Thank you, Tiara. I was hit what Gavi just said. I mean, I, I see it every day. I mean, as a prosecutor, I'm dealing with multiple defense attorneys, some that have been practicing for six months and some have been practicing for longer than I've been alive. And integrity matters. Um, in, in everything that you do. I remember being a child and going to, to work with my dad 
and dad knew like the janitor's names. Like he, I mean, he knew the janitors and he knew the executives. And I've sort of been that way in, in the same respect. Like it's important to know everybody, to be genuine with everybody because you never know who's gonna be on the other end of a situation that you need. Um, and, and just because it's the right thing to do. But I've seen it happen so many times where someone has choked because they have not been humble or because they have lacked integrity. Um, and I've seen it happen to my elders and to, and to those that, that, that come behind me. So I do believe that m more than anything, more than networking, more than anything else, integrity matters in everything that you do. Yeah, just having all around solid character. I like to summarize that. And I'd like to thank my wonderful parents because that's one thing I say we all have. Nobody thinks they're better than the next person. Everybody treats the same. Like, it's just natural. I know the clerks. I know the coordinators. I know the janitors. I'm going to speak to everybody in the security line. And uh, I think that's something that is learned behavior. You learn to see everyone as equal. And character will take you places that money will never will. I think that that's Hey, if you if you solid with everybody down to where I'm, whether I'm dealing with a prosecutor and I know Antoine's not going to lie, so I get my dismissals, or it's someone that will give me a parking space because they like how I carry their self in court. <laughs> it's you, you, if, when you carry people yourself the right way, you always keep it 100 people. They'll do the same in return. Thank you all so much for sharing this time, your words of wisdom uh, with us. Uh, we at the College of Law. And of course, me personally are just so proud of all of you, our four alums, but also your entire family. And we look forward uh, to seeing what else you all are gonna be doing uh, over the years to come, as well, of course, as what your next generation will do. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Erica Christensen, our UICHR tech guru for uh, handling uh, these matters. And we'd like to call everyone's attention uh, to the next event that will be hosted by UICHR uh, with Melanie uh, Nason, and that's going to be on uh, International Women's Day. And she is an LGBTI uh, activist, and she's going to be talking about those issues in Africa. So everyone, please have a good, good day. You will be able to go to our website listed below to see uh, this event. It'll be permanently posted and it is closed captioned as well. So everyone, please have a very good afternoon and take care. Bye. Thank you.